My name is Kathy Lu. Today, um, I want to show you our research lab. Uh, I'm a professor in material science and engineering department of Virginia Tech. I've been here for 16 years, and it's really a lovely place. And uh, the town is beautiful, and our lab is really nice, as you will see very soon. And um, uh, in materials, we do all kinds of research. We study materials from ceramics to polymers to metals. And uh, the application of materials uh, really is wide ranging. It, it ranges from uh, food ingredients to facial cream to diapers and uh, go up to golf clubs, car tires, uh, engine parts. Uh, and then we study nuclear reactor materials. We study space shuttle materials. Actually, very soon we're going to have some materials, uh, uh, material research done uh, in the International Space Station. So we really uh, uh, are a group of uh, hardcore material scientists and engineers. So today I want to show you uh, our lab briefly, and then um, my postdocs and the graduate students are going to explain a little bit more in detail about what they do and why they study uh, materials and so on. So with that, let me uh, flip the, the video and show you what uh, material research is about. Uh, this is how it's like when you enter our lab. We have this blue uh, box here. Uh, actually, it's a cabinet. It's a, uh, called acid cabinet. When you have strong acid and base, you don't want to mix them together or just lay them around in the lab. You want to store them securely in a cabinet and sort them out so that they don't interact with each other. So this is for uh, especially corrosive chemical storage. And this uh, kind of uh, creamy color box is uh, our water filter. So we don't just take tap water to do our research. We use um, uh, DI water, that means distilled, purified water, so that we can understand exactly what's going on in our research. Because a lot of chemicals we use in our research, uh, it involves 99.9% .9 purity chemicals. And then we also have our washing station. Uh, it uh, has a lot of chemicals. We also have the drying rack to dry our beakers and the flasks and so on. And uh, this side I'll show you first. This white box is called a mass spectrometer. Basically, uh, when you deal with materials, what kind of ingredient do you have? How much do you have? So this mass spectrometer can tell you in a uh, part per million level what do you have. Uh, and also, it's mainly for measuring solid material compositions. Uh, if we need to measure gas uh, compositions such as different kinds of gas uh, like uh, carbon monoxide, hydrogen, water vapor, nitrogen and so on, we use this. We call it uh, chromatography, basically it's a GC. Uh, and uh, uh, connected to these two uh, composition measurement uh, units, we have this big furnace. This furnace can go up to 1500 degrees C and you see the white tube. We actually put a sample through this tube and then we heat it up. You see the red flame on the top? Uh, this sample, this furnace is being operated right now. So during high temperature process, we um, can have material change uh, either in solid state or vapor state so we can measure the completions uh, using the mass spectrometer and the uh, chromatography, I just showed you. And on this side, it's our bench top. We do all kinds of research on our bench, so our students did a good job cleaning it right now. It's very clean. And uh, this is our centrifuge. Basically, if we want to separate them, we can spin it in this, um, in this little chamber. And then um, we put a sample inside here. And then we spin it, we can separate our material apart because they have different uh, densities. And then when you spin it, the heavy ones will uh, go to the bottom of your container first. And then we have hot plates. Uh, this is another hot plate. 
and then we have our abandons, um, and then we have a water bass. This water bass, we have the reservoir here. We can um, put uh, our sample there for weeks sometimes, keep it at uh, sub-zero degree C temperature, because when we grow nanoparticles, we don't want to grow very fast. When we go to low temperature, we slow the process down. And uh, this side, we have more benches, as you can see here. Uh, it's very important for us to use this space to do our experiments. And um, this is our uh, coater, we can coat a particle with a layer for millions of particles once. And then this one is our oven. If we need to heat our sample uh, to a uh, couple hundred degrees Celsius, we we'll use this. Uh, so you can see the oven is running right now at 130, show you, 134 or 133 degrees C. And uh, this machine is called a freeze dryer. We kind of uh, freeze our sample, but then we don't um, just uh, dry it. We actually pull the vacuum on it this way. Uh, it's like water then goes uh, through the liquid state. It goes from ice directly to vapor. Uh, so it's called sublimation. Now, in this room, we have uh, more furnaces. Uh, it, again, it's being used. You can hear the noise. The machine is running. And then we have another box furnace. It's a blue uh, thing. The bottom is a controller. And uh, we have a lot of gas cylinders because we need to put the material at high temperatures in different atmospheres. And then in this small room, we have um, this is just a water sink, as I showed you earlier, but this blue unit is called a rheometer. It measures viscosity of different species. For example, we measure how viscous water is, how viscous oil is, how viscous facial cream is, uh, how viscous your ice cream is. So uh, this is to measure the rheology of the materials. And on this side, we have this big thing, it's called a uh, glove box. In this box, I'll try to show you. See some container. We actually put a flammable materials there, a sensitive material that cannot be exposed to uh, air. So we put it there. We can use these two black things. They, they are gloves, so we can manipulate experiments or other things uh, inside the glove box. So this is uh, very very important to keep the labs safe while we conduct sensitive experiments. Um, so pretty much this is our lab. Uh, as I said, it's a very material research intensive lab and uh, we, we love it. We um, spend a lot of time here and uh, um, publish a lot of papers. Um, well, so that's all we have. My name is Yijie and I'm a postdoctoral researcher working with Dr. Kathy Liu. I'm doing my research on the materials that are used in the nuclear plant. So, um, I believe some of you have watched the TV series Chernobyl. And I'm pretty sure that you guys know the nuclear accident in Japan in 2011. This kind of accident can um, lead it to uh, deaths of people and huge economical damage to the society. So, one of the problems of this nuclear accident is the radioactive contaminant. So, the most popular nuclear um, contaminant is uh, cesium-137. And um, its half-life is about 30 years. So, it's pretty long. So, it's not very su surprising that still the Fukushima nuclear plant is releasing nuclear materials into the Pacific Ocean. So it's very important to um, develop a new material that is tolerant to this kind of nuclear accident. And also it's very important to understand the material behaviors in these accident conditions. So I'm researching the um, nuclear accident conditions that is the, that is an invasion of water and air into the nuclear cores. So if the water and air um, enters the core, there will be oxidation of the nuclear components and 
may lead to explosion of the cores. And so many nuclear components in the nuclear plants um, are made up of graphite material. So um, here, this is a um, graphite that is used for the nuclear plants, and we call this material as nuclear graphite. So this um, nuclear graphite is used for moderators and reflectors in the nuclear plant. And as I said, but this material also can be oxidized because of the water and air. So I'm studying how this graphite material will change after oxidation and how long this graphite material can survive after oxidation. So um, this is the furnace that I'm, I have been using for my experiments. And I usually use the small containers to put my samples in. And I put this containers to this tube and push this tube to the center of the, of the tube. And after that, I close the tube by this steel. Then I can heat up this tube up to 1400 degrees C. And I also use the helium gas for the flowing gas. But as you know, the helium is an inert gas that cannot oxidize of my samples. So um, I, I usually flow this gas into the water jar over here. And when I heat up this water jar to 60 or 80 degrees C, there will be some amount of water in air. And if I make some bubbles inside this water, then the helium will contain water in the, in the gas. So the water and helium mixture will go through this tube and finally will oxidize my samples. So to do this kind of study, um, I need to cut this large block into small pieces like this. And after cutting the sample in this shape, um, I need to measure the dimension and the weight of the sample because after oxidation, the weight and size will change because of the oxidation. So by repeating this kind of um, experiment, I can get the oxidation rate, rate at different temperatures. And this oxidation rate can be um, used for estimating the estimating how long the graphite can survive in the center conditions. Also, um, um, I can see the surface change before and after the oxidation. So, um, the, this image on the left side is the uh, um, specimen, specimen before the oxidation test, and this one is for the after oxidation. And you can see that there, ha there are lots of pores after oxidation. And if we use the high magnification microscope, um, we can see that there are um, lots of pores and there are very uneven surface on the samples. So um, from this kind of experiment, um, um, I can get the data for the oxidation properties. And this data can be utilized for um, designing the new nuclear plants and for um, developing new Material, uh, new graphite materials. Okay, um, that's it for today's talk, and thank you for your attention. Hi, I'm Katie Flint, a master's student researching alongside Dr. Kathy Liu and her research group. So I first got into STEM um, once I got into college. It was my first, or my first uh, degree that I was going for was physics. That didn't work out so well for me and then I went into nanoscience. Um, science has been my favorite subject all throughout you know elementary school, middle school, and high school. I always excelled at it and I was always interested in it and I think it was because for me science was the way that explained how everything worked. You know physics explains the laws of the universe, chemistry explains how everything is made up and created. Earth science and astronomy explain the planets and Earth and how that works. 
And to me, that was just always interesting because I'm an extremely curious person that always wants to understand how things work. So when I got into college, I wanted to continue pursuing that. So I started out with physics. Um, about after a year and a half of struggling with that, I realized that I wanted something more science and creative based than uh, calculation based, which is when I found nanoscience. Now, nanoscience is a fairly newer uh, field of science, roughly 30 years, which if you think about most sciences, that's pretty young. And uh, with that, I was able to basically think of science in a completely new way. It's understanding things on a level that's so small, not much is even known about it. So from there, I could work with different researchers in different fields and be able to understand each field that I grew up learning about in a completely different way. Uh, I did undergraduate research with the chemistry department where I worked on synthesizing nanoparticles and the applications that we use them for were different material-based applications, and that is where I found the material science. Uh, I knew that once I graduated with my undergraduate degree that I wanted to still learn more. I felt like I wanted to really become specialized in a field, and so I applied and got into material science and engineering. And with that, it let me continue to pursue science but also try and create new things in that field. So right now I'm currently working with, again, Dr. Kathy Liu. Um, I am working alongside another researcher in the group and we are trying to make a memory device similar to like computer memory. Um, however, we're using gold nanoparticles which have a special effect called surface plasmon resonance, where if you shine light on it, the electrons essentially become excited. So the idea is that the memory device, we can shine light on it and the particles will become excited and will create their own energy and electricity essentially. And we won't need to uh, apply an outside source of power. So with that, you know, there's really boundless applications that you can use for that, especially since it's a thin film flexible device. So flexible electronics is something that's really big and upcoming. So, you know, you can put them anywhere. You can bend them around a pole if it's a cylindrical object or anything like that. Um, as for what I would like to do after graduate school, I'm hoping to get a job I would really like to work in the space industry as that has always been uh, another big love of mine. I love watching the SpaceX rockets or learning about the planets. So if I could get a job that's, whether it's working on the rockets or the space suits or even satellites, I think that would be a really cool job. But another opportunity or career choice I've recently discovered combines another one of my uh, interest, which is history, and I found out that there are some career choices that combine material science and history together, where you use material science to study uh, ancient artifacts or buildings or anything like that, and you really learn what these ancient civilizations were doing and how much they actually did know. And I think that would be really cool because I've always loved history. Even while I was pursuing my undergraduate degree in a STEM program, I was taking at least one history course every semester, even though it wasn't needed, just because I loved learning about it. So either of those choices or opportunities, I think would be really cool to do. So as you can see with STEM, even though it's science and engineering, you can really do anything that you want with it. So I hope that you all can find something that you're also passionate about and don't be afraid to follow it. Hello everyone, I'm Jia Qi from China. I'm a visit visiting PhD student of Dr. Lu's group. Today I will show you something interesting. Have you thought about making a gel from a liquid? 
Today I will show you how to produce one in just a half an hour on your own. All the materials I have I need are just two type of, uh, two types of polysilicones named PMPS and uh, PHMS and one kind of plat uh, catalyst named called platinum catalyst. They are all polymer liquids just like common oils. Firstly, I will mix 88% of PMPS with 28% of PHMS in a beaker because PMPS are highly viscous so I need to, to be more patient to take some out of the bottle. And then I will add 28 uh, percent of PHMS to the beaker. All right. Then secondly, just add one drop of platinum catalyst to the beaker. Okay. At last, using a stirring machine to stir it for just 30 minutes. And then you will see some magic. Well, after stirring it for 30 minutes, you can see that the mixture looks white and totally solid. We can even touch it by our gloves. This stuff has a fascinating porous and uh, viscous structure but apparently it cannot be edible. The science behind this is that both polymers, PMPS and PHMS, has active atoms. They will react with each other to form a strongly bonded structure with the help of some specific catalyst like platinum catalyst to form a just like any hand structure and uh, finally convert a liquid state to a solid state. That's it. I hope you will all love it and uh, stay enthusiastic about science. Thank you for watching. Hello everyone. My name is Bob. I'm the PhD student in material science and engineering. Today, this video is going to show me what I did every day. Right now, you can see something here is the solution dropping into another solution. The upper device looks like a cylinder is called Bernate. You will control the speed of the dropping solution inside the beaker. And the yellow plate is called a steel plate. It can heat and it can also create a magnetic force to let the steel bar inside the beaker to steer the solutions. So what is the inside the solution? In the Bernays, there is a zirconia precursor. And in the and in the beaker there is uh, ammonia as a reaction. So this reaction is the precipitate reaction. Precipitate is something like when like two solutions react together, you will create a solid. So right now we are producing the zirconia particle solid. What can apply in zirconia is it's a shape membrane, shape membrane ceramic. Shape membrane is like when we heat, when we apply the force on the particle, it will deform, and after that, it will just re, it will just reverse and come back to the original shape. 
something like rubber, but you can apply in other field like semiconductor and uh, electric device. Okay, as we can see here, this whole unit is called a film put, chemical film put. This function is like inside the film hood, it will suck the air into the atmosphere. So you will just so it's something for the chemical reaction when we have a create a something like very weird smell or even something toxic. So we will just perform a chemical reaction inside. Oh, this is just one of my, one of the uh, that in our group. Something interesting I can introduce. This container. It's called a. Uh, it's contain the uh, liquid nitrogen. So this container is like very similar like your lunch bag. When we put something cold there. You will just keep the keep the material inside to keep cooling. So in the chemi like in chemical lab, we we like to like put every chemical inside different group. Like this cabin is put in acid, and there's a refrigerator here to store the chemical that's easy to oxidize so we just put the chemical inside to let it cool and there's other chemical in the cabinet and this is gas to go so we use the vial or other like uh, or for other something made of gas we can just deposit here Okay, I think that's it. Science is very important. Some, <laughs> some students, you may think science is uh, just a boring subject in the school, but everything is made, of, made from science. If you have any questions, just ask your parents, your family, your friend, or the science teacher. Science is fun. Bye-bye. Hello everyone, I'm Sanjay Kumar. I'm doing postdoctoral research at Virginia Tech. I mainly work on materials, that is nuclear materials. I will explain about the nuclear fuels which are used in the nuclear reactors. There are several kinds of nuclear uh, fuels which are used in the nuclear reactor, which generally can be divided into three categories. That is uh, uh, ceramic or ceramic metal or metal metal. Each fuel kinds has a different advantages as well as disadvantages. They can be used as a pellet form or it can be used as a slug like a, that's called metallic rods or it could be used as a microspheres. Conventionally people have used this ceramic pellet but generally are try to avoid using this pellet form because it has some problems. All these nuclear fuels should withstand the high temperature as well as the horse irradiation or radiation, otherwise it will undergo some microstructural changes. Nuclear fuels, uh, one category is called trisophiles. Generally, they coated these nuclear fuels using different layers of materials in order to avoid the fission products to come out of the fuels. So this fission product, when they come out of the nu nuclear reactor, or if it reacts with the cladding material, it will decrease the lifespan of the nuclear reactor reactors which they use trisophiles have some problems. So we have to develop some kind of new kind of coatings. So I'm working on this new kind of uh, coating material which is nothing but silicon oxycarbide. Uh, I use polymer derived ceramic method combined with fluidized bed coating in order to coat this uh, fuels with uh, polymers which upon pyrolysis gives out the silicon oxycarbide I will coatings. I have cleaned the microspheres using water and then acetone in order to dissolve any 
impurities and subsequently I have heated at 1300 degrees Celsius in organ atmosphere. In order to remove all these organic binders or any other impurities which will hinder the coating process. So this is an uh, uncoated material. We can see it is uh, uniformly distributed and it has a size of around 500 micron. Uh, this is the black coater machine which is which I use for the coating of this EPS stabilized zirconia particles. Uh, before making a uh, coating of the particle, we have to make the solution or polymer solution. I use polysiloxane as a as a mat coating material which is dissolved in a pentane solvent. Pentane solvent has been chosen because it can get evaporated with temperature. At nominal temperature as around 60 degrees Celsius is sufficient to evaporate this pentane. Polysiloxane has been dispersed in pentane solvent. This pentane solvent is made to move through these tubes into the glad coating machine. And here we can see that the flow of the liquid can be controlled by using this uh, peristatic pump. Here we can see that the rate of movement of this uh, liquid can be modified by increasing or decreasing the uh, these buttons. And the flow also can be altered, altered between back and forth depending upon the need or what material we have to coat it. So now what happens, all this liquid when it flows through this tube, here we can see that it has two it has an inner nozzle. Inner nozzle will be comprising of uh, two concentric circles. The center nozzle will be through which this polymer liquid will be coming out, whereas the outer nozzle is the gas compressed air which will be spraying this polymer solution into this chamber. Uh, this is the glad coater vessel. I have dispersed my particle into this and we can carry out the experiment without this tube or with the tube. Generally, this is called as washer tube. Washer tube helps, helps the particles to move through in a circular direction like a fountain. So, particle will can get suspended in here. At the same time, the liquid which is coming out will get, will collide with the particles and it will get coated. And once the temperature has been increased to some like 60 to 80 degree, the, all the solvents will get evaporated whereas the polymer Will be coated onto the uh, microspheres and it will fall onto this. This the process is repeated for some time. Uh, so now I have connected the instrument, the flat coated bottom vessel, with the main holder. And here we can see that once the instrument is in good condition, good working condition, you will have the green signal. And uh, before starting the experiment, we have to see whether the gas flow can be is it proper or not. This tube is probably the spray hair takes place. If you see here at the bottom, the compressed hair flows at this, through this tube. The compressed hair helps the particle which is coated when it falls down. It gets again suspended into, into the hair and it's the process, it's a cyclic process. So now uh, what will happen is we can adjust the flow of compressed hair through the bottom as well as the spray. The rate of spray of this polymer solution can also be adjusted using this knob. So before starting the experiment, I have just adjusted this knob and now I am increasing the temperature and you can see that the temperature can be adjusted by using uh, increase and decreasing. For my experiment, I generally use 80 degrees Celsius. So once, once the peristatic valve has been connected now and everything is fit, you can see that the flow of compressed air and the spray has started and the, now the coating process has started. Generally, this process takes place for 5 minutes or 10 minutes depending upon the material we use it or what with what polymer we use it depending upon the uh, microstructure we need it or how much thickness we need it, we can uh, tune our coating process. If we want the coating process to have some colors, then we can use some pigment. Once the coating process has been completed, these materials are generally dried in the oven. We can see that the particle size has been increased and it is it has been coated with polymer which we have used finally we will be, we will be getting a microspheres which is coated with silicon oxycarbide hello kids my name is Jan and i'm doing this research in virginia tech 
and I come from Czech Republic and I'm here for some uh, research stay. What we have here is actually different atmosphere, something like that you would be on different planet. Why? You know, in air, here around, we have nitrogen, we have oxygen, we have some other gases, but some of the materials are very sensitive to oxygen. They could, can, they could be like broken and spoiled, and we need some type of materials that can survive in different atmospheres. Actually, this is named uh, uh, glove, box, glove Box, and in Glove Box there is an argon atmosphere. Because argon is totally different uh, gas, which is inactive. So there inside I have a material, and this material is some polymer, and this polymer doesn't like air so much. It, it would be like hard and agglomerated. So what I'm doing here is actually using this different atmosphere. So actually this is like having a different planet in your office or in your laboratory. And what I'm doing now, here in this argon atmosphere, I am placing the material from this uh, bottle to my small bottle and it will survive to transport. Then I will take it out using some chamber, a similar chamber as astronauts are using on ISS because you know, Astronauts on ISS, on International Space Station, when they need to go out, they cannot like open doors because all, all gas will leak and everybody will die. So they need to go to special chamber. They will lock, the, lock themselves there in this special chamber. And we have it here. And so this, is tra this transportation chamber will do the transition between this amazing argon atmosphere to our human atmosphere. So let's check it. I think that's enough of material. I think that's okay. And why I have it? Actually I'm trying to use this as a production of my coatings. I will make a droplet on some metal and it will create some polymer coatings and I will bake it actually in the normal oven, a little higher than normal uh, baking cookies, something like 600 up to 800 Celsius. So I will place it here. And now we have all argon here. And I will just close it down. Like, as same as astronauts, if they will go to outer space from International Space Station. So now it's closed. And we have, and how it works. So he here we have argon. Here we have nothing. So I will set argon there, it's already there. And now it's closed, it's full of argon now. And when I open it, I will just spoil this part. And releasing the argon. And surprisingly, I'm not dead because argon is not, uh, argon is not danger, dangerous. So I have here my Material, if I will open it, it's not, not like the uh, air, but it will survive a little, like several days. It will be okay. So nowadays, and if I want to take something in, in it, I would, I would use this instrument. It's called a vacuum chamber, vacuum pump. It will take out the air from it. And so this is like how I transport things inside and outside. So this is what I do. A space science in my laboratory. Hi guys, today I want to show you how to make the homemade cheese. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Li Yang and you can call me Lily. I'm a PhD student in Virginia Tech and my major is material science and engineering. So I know a lot about materials. I think a lot of people like the idea of making their cheese but have never tried because it seems so complicated. I'm here to tell you, to tell everyone, actually it is super easy. So here we go. What do you need for making a homemade cheese? First, the whole milk. You can buy it at every market. Would you know that the, actually the milk is a suspension made of solid particles? There are two kinds of the particles. One is 
protein. The other another is fat. Actually, these two kinds of particles, they are very stable inside the milk. So it that seems the milk is a homogeneous white liquid. However, if we change something, then they will not become so stable. Think about one situation. If you put the milk under sunshine for a few days, then what will happen? The milk will go bad, and you will find the milk will be separated. The second thing you need is the white vinegar. A uh, white vinegar is one kind of the acid. Like for some people, they don't like the smell of the vinegar. Like me, I really don't like it. So you can use the lemon juice to make the home to make the cheese. Then that will be okay. And the third thing you need is the cheese cloth. I will use it later. So wait and see. Okay. So step one is you should pour the milk into the pot and heat it until it reaches boil. Please be careful and don't touch the hot plate. Also, please don't forget to stir it constantly from sticking under the bottom of the pot. And the step two is pour the vinegar into the milk. Let's see what will happen. Oh my god! Would you see that there are some Solid participate at the bottom of the glass. Do you see it? Wow, it's so amazing. And also, please remember to stir it. Okay, then the step three. Pour this mixture into the cheesecloth. We should get rid of the water, so we only want the solid from the mixture. Okay, just be patient. Okay, if it becomes so slow, then you can use your finger. You can use your fingers to squeeze it out. Wow. So amazing. Okay. Let me show you. Wow. You see, this is the cheese. It seems it's very delicious yeah and if you don't like the flavor you can add some fresh fruits or some spices into it why you not try it today enjoy hi there my name is Adbai Threll and I am a PhD student in Dr. Kathy Liu's group here at Virginia Tech in the material science and engineering department most of my work is focused on novel polymer derived ceramics and creating novel materials for high temperature applications and other advanced applications as well. Um, when we talk about polymer derived ceramics, we're talking about any material that you take from a, a common plastic containing silicon, oxygen, and carbon, and after, after significant heat treatment, turns into a ceramic such as silicon carbide, or silicon oxycarbide, or silicon nitride, so on and so forth. Um, ceramics are known to have some of the highest um, uh, some of, some of the highest uh, strengths and resistance to fracture and other corrosive uh, benefits as well. Um, so we, we see a lot of our polymer derived ceramics with applications in batteries, uh, aerospace applications, ultra high temperature ceramics, and so on and so forth. We are personally working on silicon oxycarbide and silicon carbide derivatives, and to that extent. Some of the work we do, we have to do a lot of characterization. So this is the characterization lab here at Virginia Tech in the material science department. We have plenty of instrumentation back there. Um, a lot of expensive equipment, but also a lot of good data that you get from that. Uh, one instrument that I use in particular is the TGA over here. Um, TGA stands for Thermogravimetric Analysis. 
and it's essentially a very expensive uh, and very precise scale. Um, you can get readings down to 0.1 or 0.01 um, milligrams, um, in, and even beyond that. And so what this machine does is it helps, um, it looks at material degradation properties as you heat them up in different uh, in atmospheres. Um, so what we do is you load your sample into this tiny little pan, and you stick it in here, in this furnace. And after heating up, you can track what the changes in temperature are. I'm sorry, the changes in mass and other properties are. Um, we use a, use this a lot, for, especially for polymerized ceramics, just because um, a lot of our material behavior is dependent on, um, and material probably dependent on how much mass is lost and the species of of uh, elements and other other phases present in our system at the end. Another another instrument that I like to use is called our DMA, or Dynamic Mechanical Analysis. Similarly, this can go up to higher temperatures and lower temperatures, and it can test uh, different materials and different uh, modes of mechanical behavior. Some examples are above, we see modes of deformation. We have cantilever bending, uh, three-point bending, tension, compression, and shear. Um, we, I'll, we, all, we like to use these not only just for room temperature materials, but also for um, evaluating material properties at higher temperatures. Um, some of the work I actually did before I joined Virginia Tech is um, looking at uh, some polymers for uh, dental, dental surgery. And for that, we had to look at material properties at negative 30 to 40 degrees Celsius. So quite, quite cold. Um, I can go on and go uh, about the other equipment, but um, I feel um, I feel like you guys would get the point, and it's just a lot of the, a lot of cool um, a lot of cool facilities we have here at Virginia Tech. Um, personally, I like studying MSc um, material science and engineering because at the very basis of it, everything is material um, from your common day fork to the highest uh, aerospace grade alloys and materials and I kind of find something poetic about that that um, anything you do you deal with some material in some shape or form whether it be organic or man-made and trying to find the perfect material is not quote-unquote easy um, it's you have to look for the perfect material and for the right condition and that's kind of what drives me in in research and studying material science um, and just be able to have access to all this uh, characterization uh, equipment and other stuff that is not pictured as well. Um, thanks for uh, letting me talk to you guys. Um, it was nice to be able to show some of the stuff here at Virginia Tech. And please feel free to reach out to Dr. Liu if you have any further questions. Thank you.